Welcome back to National Day of Courage, the celebration of Rosa Parks' 100th birthday. Uh, we're covering all the events here live here today at the Henry Ford in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, you can follow along with us on Twitter at the Henry Ford under the hashtag Day of Courage. Also find us on Facebook, and you can catch all of today's events live streamed on the web at dayofcourage.org. Right now, we're going to go to the stage uh, where we've got a panel of historians and authors, all of whom have written about Rosa Parks. It's indeed an honor to be here and to be serving as the moderator uh, at this historic event commemorating the 100th birthday of Rosa Parks, um, Mrs. Rosa Parks and her legacy of courage and determination, uh, fearlessness in the face of all kinds of oppressions. So, you know, I'm just honored being on the stage with her image and this beautiful stamp behind us. Isn't it beautiful? Beautiful. And of course, we're very grateful to the Ford uh, Museum for orchestrating this entire event. Now, we're going to follow a along this path, if my fellow panelists don't mind. I'd like for you both uh, all three of you sequentially to come up and present 10, 15 minutes, not 15, but 10 minutes or so uh, about your engagement with Rosa Parks as a historian and the questions that were absolutely essential in the development of your respective books. Okay. And then after that, I'll have a few questions for you. Uh, elaborating on some of the themes you raised in your books um, and trying to think about what's next in terms of Rosa Parks scholarship. So um, if we have time left after that, we will turn it open to the audience and you will have an opportunity to ask any question that you desire an answer for. Um, I just want to start by saying one thing document that I have here uh, with me. It is Rosa Parks' arrest document. Um, it's dated 12-1-55. The time of the offense was 6.06 p.m. It happened in front of Empire Theater on Montgomery Street. And this is what the police officers wrote. We received a call upon arrival. The bus operator said he had a colored female sitting in the white section of the bus and would not move back. And the police officers wrote, we also saw her. The bus operator signed the warrant. She was arrested. And they say the time of the arrest was 7 p.m. And of course, we know Fred Gray and E.D. Nixon and a number of others, leading citizens in Montgomery, went and paid, helped her to pay that $10 fine and brought her back, and after that, there was no stopping Rosa Parks and the women political council who led the way to the formation of the Montgomery Improvement Association. And for 381 days, not a black woman set foot on a bus in Montgomery, and the rest is history. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Professor Hines. She herself is an American treasure, all that she's done for women's studies and African American history and American history in, in general is quite seminal, and it's wonderful to be here with you. Um, I got involved with Rosa Parks because I had a bus I called the Magic Bus. 
and I would bring first college students. We'd go around the country, and they'd earn college credits living on my bus, and we would read classics. So we would read Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman and then meet with Arthur Miller. We'd meet, read Beloved by Toni Morrison and then be with Toni Morrison, on and on, all across the country. And I then started taking people on civil rights bus tours in the South, and specifically high school students. Many like are around us today and have been performing and here with us. And I would take them to, we'd read the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman at a sugar plantation. Or we'd go to Atlanta and meet with Congressman John Lewis or Julian Bond in Montgomery, Alabama, on and on. And when we would go to Montgomery, I would pull the bus in front of the little housing project home, apartment, that Rosa and Raymond Parks lived. And there's no historic marker there. It was just, we would walk right in and talk to some locals that were there. Uh, the city of Montgomery had yet to build a Rosa Parks Museum. And I was shocked to find that there had not been a serious-minded book written on Rosa Parks. She had written her own book, My Story, with the help of Jim Haskins. And there have been many children's biographies, but uh, there were 250 books on Martin Luther King and so very little on Rosa Parks. And so I decided um, it, it coincided with a company called Penguin Books, who asked me to write a Penguin Lives on any American figure I wanted to, and I did Rosa Parks. And at that point, um, I got helped along by Elaine Steele, who was here earlier, and, and who allowed me to spend time with Mrs. Parks in Detroit, in um, Beverly Hills, and in Washington, D.C. She used to stay at a place called The Mansion on, um, with a woman named H. And Mrs. Parks would go to D.C. and spend quite a bit of time there with her friend H. And I can only tell you, getting to know Mrs. Parks through Elaine and, and, and the people that work at the Rosa and Raymond Parks Institute was one of my thrills where people would move her in her wheelchair around, and if somebody saw her, they would just go up and want to touch her. They just would want to touch her cheek as if it was touching history. And she had a very powerful um, impact on people that encountered her and that were with her. And so not only did I get to spend a little time with her, I started writing th this, uh, this book on Rosa Parks. And a couple of the tell you a few things in my short 10-minute duration that stick out in my mind about her, um, and there are many, but one is she stressed that I'm just not African-American. I have Cherokee blood, I have Scotch-Irish blood, that we're all in a way mulatto Americans, and that African-Americans are the original Americans. They've been here since the beginning. And, um, and that was something that meant a lot to her, that she was the sense of inclusion of people and that how foolish, I think, this idea of um, discrimination and prejudice uh, by skin color was. Another aspect of her is her devotion to Christ. It doesn't get talked about that much, and later she got very involved with Buddhism. But she was a longtime member of the African Methodist Episcopalian Church, the AME Church, the Freedom Church. And because Dr. King was Southern Christian Leadership Conference as Baptist, everybody thinks the Civil Rights Movement was just the Baptist um, in the South. But the AME Church played a mighty role. And she was a longtime deaconess in the AME Church. And then, of course, um, was here in Detroit and religiously would go every, every Sunday. Another aspect about Rosa Parks is her absolute unwavering love of children. Um, now, she never had any children of her own, so she adopted all of the world's children as her own. And I don't say that with, in, a, in a sense of hyperbole. Um, she, if you really look at some of her crusades early in life, as Elaine knows so well, I mean, she would... Um, early on wanted in Montgomery in Alabama not to have separate libraries. How awful would it be to have a, a fact that African-American kids weren't allowed to get a book out of the library? I mean, how, how um, cruel and what debauchery that kind of Jim Crow is. And she stood up for children. She would work with the NAACP children's group in Montgomery. 
In fact, she got to know the kids of Montgomery so that when you get to that December 1st, 1955 arrest, what buzzed around Montgomery is, oh my gosh, they arrested Rosa Parks? Somebody who was church going, somebody who loved kids, somebody who never swore, somebody who was so polite. Who would arrest her and fingerprint her and throw her in jail? Um, so part of her power was by, by the power of her reputation at that time. If you couldn't allow that, it was too mind-boggling that that's how debased white supremacy is, that they would put Rosa Parks in jail as if she were a criminal. Another point that stuck out in me writing it was, um, you know, there was a Maxwell Air Force Base down there in Alabama, and she worked for a while there, and you would be able to take a bus, um, you'd have to ride a segregated bus to the base, but it was integrated in the 50s. So once you were on the military base by the federal government, you could eat at the same cafeteria, you could sit at the same table. So while Rosa Parks didn't travel a lot, she didn't leave Alabama in those years, um, she had, in the early Cold War period, recognized that there was another way. It was right in her backyard at, at the federal uh, facility in Alabama. So that, that desegregation of the military that occurred under Harry Truman gets overlooked sometimes, but because Brown versus Topeka in 54 overwhelms it to such a degree. But we shouldn't, in history, overlook how important that was and influenced her. Another thing I remember about Mrs. Parks is her love of Booker T. Washington. Um, today, of course, W.E.D. Du Bois is the big figure, intellectual African-American figure, and Harvard has the Du Bois School, and Du Bois's um, writings are more seminal in many ways than Booker T. Washington. But in the South, Booker T. was a big deal, and he built the industrial schools, including industrial schools for girls, and the whole Tuskegee principal and Rosa Parks being born in Tuskegee and the power of Booker T. Washington and that um, black belt of Alabama is very, very large and he shouldn't be underestimated. I think in academic circles we pit Du Bois versus Booker T. Washington's vision when, uh, and certainly Du Bois probably deserves the lion's share of a lot of the credit, but we don't want to marginalize Booker T. Washington's importance and Mrs. Parks certainly didn't. Also, as, as Elaine knows very well, Mrs. Parks got very infatuated with the Underground Railroad history in later years. And I always found it kind of moving after her bad incident where somebody broke into her house here in Detroit and beat her. In Detroit, Rosa Parks got, her house got raided. They, they beat Rosa Parks. She had to go to, I believe, Detroit Receiving Hospital and uh, eventually she was able to have a safe haven in a condominium overlooking the Detroit River um, over where the, the um, slaves would seek for freedom in Canada over to Windsor and beyond. And, um, and that, that notion of Harriet Tubman meant a lot to her because do you realize Harriet Tubman, um, Rosa Parks was born and a month later Harriet Tubman died. So there's this direct connection, almost Tubman to Rosa Parks. Um, and you know, so she had a great admiration for, for Harriet Tubman. And then also Mrs. Parks' um, love of her husband, Raymond. It can't really be overstated. Um, there was a lot of misogyny in, um, in, in, uh, in America. <laughs> there still is. But in the Civil Rights Movement, there was too. And it took a lot for Raymond to have a wife who became a superstar, a celebrity, who got to travel all over. And he was able to back her action, if you like. And she never, never forgot that. And, and she always wanted Rosa and Raymond Park. She always, in her self-deprecating way, wanted to make sure he wasn't written out of the history books because she couldn't have done a lot without having a husband who was supportive of a woman doing that kind of activist work. I also, um, and you'll hear more about this from our marvelous new bi um, biographer, Rosa Parks, I'm sure. But um, I was always impressed with Mrs. Parks' uh, story, you know, when Martin Luther um, King went to Birmingham in the 60s. And he gave a speech at a podium like I am, and a guy from the audience came up and, and, and punched King in the face. 
he was angry that the black entertainer, Sammy Davis Jr., was dating a white woman. And he came and actually attacked King, and King just kept his hands at his side. And he was showing his nonviolence, and he said, tried to talk him down. Why did you just hit me? And it was, a, it was theater almost of, of nonviolence and action. And afterwards, Rosa Parks administered some aspirin and a Coca-Cola, but later commented, you know, boy, that Martin took nonviolence really far. If somebody punches me in the face, I'm going to punch back. Um, and I think to a new biography we're going to, you'll be hearing about, that's a big point in her. This is not just a passive person. Um, she, um, this is somebody who knew what, what when you trod, pushed her the wrong way, she knew how to stand up for herself. And so there's, we're using the word courage and bravery a lot today, appropriately. Um, but it's also done out of love. She loved people, but there was sometimes you had to face evil in, in, in the face. Finally, which I ended my book on Rosa Parks on. I was always very touched by the story here in Detroit, which when um, Nelson Mandela got released from Robben Island prison, and um, Kat, he, suddenly he was a fetid here in America. Strom Thurmond met with him in Washington, and George Herbert Walker Bush, and they gave Mandela a ticker tape parade in New York. And he had said, I want to come to Detroit to meet two of my heroes, Boxer Joe Lewis and Rosa Parks. Well, lo and behold, as the a moment of Mandela arriving at the um, airport arrived, they, there was a um, nobody had invited Rosa Parks to meet Mandela. She tried to get in, and security, Secret Service didn't have her information, so they said basically you can't come. And Judge Damon Keith sort of forced her and said, Rosa, you're coming. He was an octogenarian like her, so he could talk to her in a way others wouldn't. Yeah, I don't care. You know, be quiet, Rosa. You're coming. You know, Mandela said he wanted to see you. We're going to get you here. And eventually, even though she was reluctant because she didn't want to take center stage or something, they got her near the front of the line, and Mandela got off the plane and was, you know, doing victory signs. And there were people selling T-shirts. And there's this great hoopla. Suzaban kind of energy because of Mandela arriving. And as he started walking, his eyes fixed on Rosa Parks. And uh, all, he could barely talk. And all he could really say was her name. You know, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. With tears coming to his eyes. And when they embrace Mandela and Ro Rosa Parks, you realize these are two warriors. I mean, one fighting Jim Crow the other fighting um, South Africa, true warriors for human rights, yet their personalities were so human and warm and decent, and that Rosa Parks was always to her last day thinking about how to make our lives, people lives better. And Elaine had me come up once, I don't know if you remember this, but um, I'll never forget and I'll end. I went to a, here in Detroit, to a school where Rosa Parks and the Parks Institute started having kids in school, little, you know, middle school, high school kids, teaching senior citizens how to email because the computers were new. And yet, if you're in a senior citizen home, if you learn how to use a laptop, you could communicate to grandkids. You don't have to be, um, you know, uh, sequestered off from the world. Until her last days of her life, she was working on projects like that. So um, we're here to celebrate her courage, but I also want to celebrate on her 100th birthday her heart, which knew no bounds, her amount of love that she had for all of us. Thank you. That was really incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Henry Ford Museum for putting this incredible event together and for inviting me and, and letting me be part of this incredible group of uh, authors and historians. I think I've learned uh, nearly everything I know from each of the people here on the stage. Um, I came prepared with pictures, so I thought I would, I would give a little lecture, but I promise I won't put you to sleep. So I want to start talking about the, um, in the wake of Barack Obama's inauguration, it's really easy to forget the indignities and terror African Americans endured. 
easy to forget that simply surviving segregation required ordinary people to engage in extraordinary acts of courage every single day. Like so many African Americans who came of age during Jim Crow, Rosa Parks' courage was not limited to one day or one act. Parks cultivated courage throughout her life. She called on it during the darkest days of the Depression when African Americans were targeted for lynching and rape. She deployed it through the civil rights era when white vigilantes burned crosses and bombed churches to thwart struggles for civil rights. And she armed herself with it to battle inequality and lack of opportunity on the dusty back roads of Alabama and the broad boulevards of Detroit. And so today, on the 100th anniversary of Rosa Parks' birth, let us remember how brave she was to continuously defy the segregated system that denied her humanity. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? This section of Psalm 27, Parks called on frequently. And she called on it in the spring of 1931, just after her 18th birthday. She was working alone as a domestic, as so many black women did during those days, when a white man whom she called Mr. Charlie sexually assailed her. For the help, as she was at that time, there was nowhere to run, no one to hear you scream. I stood still, she said, and breathed a prayer. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Suddenly, she wrote, all my fear had been replaced by a hard as tempered steel determination to resist. I talked and talked, she said, of everything I knew about the white man's inhumane treatment of the Negro and the supposed white supremacy the white man's law drawing the color line of segregation. Now, faith in God may have enabled Parks to resist Mr. Charlie, but when she refused to obey the white man's law in Montgomery 24 years later, it was a decision rooted in decades of militant resistance to inequality and activism against injustice. But we cannot forget as we talk today about her courage, how dangerous it was to challenge the segregated status quo. Throughout the 1930s, Rosa Parks and her husband, for example, hosted clandestine meetings to raise money for the defense of the Scottsboro Boys. She talked about it. She said, we had someone posted as lookout, and someone always had a gun. Like her Garveyite grandfather, she believed in self-defense. But she was angry about the fact that African Americans, she said, quote, could not hold a meeting without fear of bodily injury or death. In 1943, Parks joined the local NAACP. But in addition to serving as secretary, she also had the job uh, to investigate and document acts of racial violence, something that required vast stores of bravery. In other words, she was not just a secretary, she was a detective. Her investigative work for the NAACP exposed her to the horrific racial and sexual violence that whites visited upon African Americans who defied Jim Crow. Things happened, Rosa Parks said, that most people never even heard about. She said there were many, many cases to keep records on. One of those cases in the fall of 1944, for example, uh, she was sent by the Montgomery NAACP down to Abbeville, Alabama to investigate the rape of a black woman named Recy Taylor. Recy Taylor was a young mother, and sharecropper, who was walking home from a church revival when a carload of white men kidnapped her off the street, drove her to the woods, and they gang raped her at gunpoint. Then they dropped her off in the middle of town, and they told her if she told anybody what happened, they would kill her. It's a pretty credible threat in 1944 in Alabama. 
But somehow she found the strength to tell her father, her husband, and the local sheriff the details of that brutal assault, and the NAACP in Montgomery heard about it. And they called her and they said, we are sending our very best detective. Her name was Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks arrived on Reese Taylor's doorstep late one evening with a notebook and a pen. Just before the sheriff chased her out of town, she managed to record Taylor's testimony. Then she carried it back to Montgomery, where she and the city's most militant activists organized the Committee for Equal Justice for Mrs. Reese Taylor. They planned mass meetings. They canvassed neighborhoods. They signed petitions. They launched a movement that the Chicago Defender, the largest black newspaper in the nation, called the strongest movement for equal justice to be seen in a decade. And she was right. Most people have never even heard about it. Nor have they heard about the other work that she did to expose racialized sexual violence, which in many ways was the ruthless heart of the racial caste system. In the late 1940s and the early 1950s, she fought to free Jeremiah Reeves, a black teenager who was sentenced to death for having a consensual relationship with a white woman. In 1949, she worked with local activists to defend Gertrude Perkins, a black woman who was kidnapped and raped by two white Montgomery police officers. And in the 1950s, she, like so many other black women in Montgomery, turned her attention to the city's segregated buses, which really were sites of violence against black women. Their testimonies about what they had to endure on that bus will break your heart. So when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man on December 1st, 1955, she knew, she knew the dangers that she faced by choosing arrest. She had 12 years of notes on every instance of racial brutality in and around Montgomery. She knew, for example, that some black women in the custody of white police officers disappeared forever. She knew that others were beaten, were sexually harassed, and some were raped. There was no way to be without fear as the police officers drove her to jail. She knew she would be vulnerable every single minute she sat behind bars but she did it anyway. When Rosa Parks finally called home, her mother answered and said, did they beat you? That these were her first words speak volumes about the context and the courage of Parks' protest. A few days later, of course, Rosa Parks lost her job as a tailor, so she devoted her days to the boycott. She answered phones. She served as dispatcher for the indispensable carpool system, and she gave speeches throughout the country. Her role in the boycott did not bring her glory or fame. It brought constant harassment and death threats. And when segregationists promised to teach Rosa Parks, quote, a harsh lesson at a massive Klan rally in February of 1956, she asked Martin Luther King and Edie Nixon, the leaders of the boycott, to provide night watchmen at her home. When vigilantes started bombing black homes and churches and businesses in Montgomery, Parks decided she would rather live somewhere else than die in Alabama. And so she moved here in 1957. And although she quickly realized the Motor City was no promised land, she continued to courageously defy white supremacy. And for the next five decades, something that Jean Theo Harris has written extensively about, she devoted herself to the African-American freedom struggle. It's been nearly eight decades since Rosa Parks courageously defended herself against Mr. Charlie, and seven decades since she rode down to Abbeville to gather the facts in Reese Taylor's case. The protest movement that she helped start in 1944 helped build the infrastructure necessary for the bus boycott and ultimately the modern civil rights movement. Instead of a a tired seamstress who just tiptoed into history. She was a woman who marched proudly with strength, conviction, and purpose. A woman whose tireless efforts at community engagement and activism over 70 years helped make the world a better place for us all.
That she did this despite the very real threats to her life is all the more astonishing. Her long history as an active citizen engaged in the most pressing issues of our and her time, especially racial and sexual violence, can teach us how to do the same thing in ours. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I wanted to start with thank yous. Um, first, it is so wonderful to be here today, to be at the Henry Ford on this incredible program with, these, with this incredible lineup on this panel with Julian Bond this morning, with Congressman Conyers. Um, as many of you know, my book is just brand new out, and so this is the first time I've been in Detroit since my book came out last week. And so I also want to say a number of thank yous to so many people both here in Detroit and in Montgomery and across the country who helped me tell the story that I tell in its pages. So I would like to thank Dorothy and Dan Aldridge, Julian Bond, John Conyers, Judge Damon Keith, General Baker, Barbara Alexander, Elaine Steele, Carolyn Green, Loretta White, Rhea McCauley, Gregory Reed, Edward Vaughn, Chokwe Lumumba, Mabel Williams, Frank Joyce, Fred Durhall, Quill Petway, Leon Atchison, Larry Horowitz, Joanne Watson, Alfonso Hunter, Bonzi Whitlow, Eleanor Blackwell, William Anderson, Adam Shakur, David Ashenfelter, Nikki Giovanni, Doug Brinkley, the staff at the Ruther Library, so many more people across the country, and of course my friends and family who are here today to hear me give this talk. Um, so part of what I wanted to talk about very briefly today, and obviously both Doug Brinkley and Danielle McGuire have started to fill in this incredible rich history of Rosa Parks, is to talk about a lifetime of courage. Not an act of courage, not a day of courage, not a year of courage, but a lifetime of courage. A lifetime of courage that began with her family, with how she was raised um, by a mother and uh, grandparents who taught her to be respectful, but also to expect respect back. And her grandfather was, as Danielle said, a supporter of Marcus Garvey. And in the wake of World War I, when the Klan raged through Alabama, he would sit out with a shotgun on their porch and a young Rosa Parks would sit with him. And so she learned very early, right, that sense of determination. She marries Raymond Parks, who she calls the first real activist she ever met. And he is working on behalf of the nine Scottsboro boys. And so very much her adult political life starts there, starts as a newlywed, right? And that courage continues. In 1943, she sees a picture of a friend at an NAACP meeting and realizes that women can be part of the local branch. And so she goes down to join. And uh, she's the only woman there, so they elect her secretary. And she wants to register to vote. Um, and so she meets a man by the name of Edie Nixon. And Edie Nixon is a sleeping car porter, and he's active in the union. And he's a real um, sort of stalwart activist in town. And he comes by her apartment to bring her some materials. And that meeting really changes the course of American history. Because Edie Nixon and Rosa Parks will work to transform the Montgomery NAACP branch into a more activist branch, into a branch that, as we heard, investigates cases of white brutality, of sexual violence, of legal lynching, right? And she is, she, travels around Alabama to document those, to, to sort of make affidavits, right? She, um, they work on voter registration. And I think today when we hear the NAACP, sometimes that sounds sort of like, it sounds tame, right? But as we heard, this is anything but tame, right? This is deeply dangerous work. It takes huge courage, right? And over and over, right there, they, they put forth cases over and over. They work on voter registration over and over. They press for school desegregation. And many of this doesn't, you know, sort of doesn't go very far, right? And so over and over, year after year, in the decade before her courageous bus stand, right, she has made stand after stand alongside 
um, a group of other Montgomery activists. So the idea that she comes to that night, right, as some sort of spontaneous act or doesn't understand what, what it means to take that step that evening, right, but pushed as far as she could be pushed, those are her words, right, she decides to stand fast. And in her autobiography, she's very clear, right? She, the idea that her feet were tired or that she was some particularly sort of, you know, she was too tired to get up, right? She writes in her autobiography, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. And so she, she is arrested, right? James Fred Blake, the bus driver, has a gun. Right? He says, I'm going to have you arrested. She says, you may do that. Uh, he goes and calls his supervisor, who says, put her off the bus. He says, put her off the bus. He doesn't necessarily say, um, arrest her, get her arrested. Um, so in many ways, also, that Blake chose, chose to go the extra step. Right? She had had, as we heard earlier, she had had trouble on the bus before. She had resisted on the bus before. Right? So this is not, again, an isolated incident. Many other people had resisted on the bus before. Her neighbor had been killed in 1950 when he resisted on the bus. The young Claudette Colvin, 15-year-old Claudette Colvin, had been manhandled by police when she was arrested in March. Right? So Rosa Parks doesn't know if she's going to get off the bus alive. She is arrested. And then on that Monday when she is arraigned, the Women's Political Council calls for a one-day boycott, right? To, and then that night at Holt Street Baptist Church, the church is filled, thousands of people are outside the church, and they resolve to carry on that boycott. But her courage doesn't end there. Her courage continues both during the boycott, a month into the boycott, she loses her job, her husband loses his job. Um, they never find steady work again in Montgomery. They are getting constant sort of death threats and hate calls. And yet she spends much of the boycott traveling the United States, raising money and public attention to help the Montgomery Improvement Association and the NAACP. So even as her own family is in economic trouble, she is doing this work of raising money and raising attention. When the boycott ends, they still cannot find work. They are still getting death threats and they choose to leave Montgomery to Detroit where her brother Sylvester lives. Um, and she calls it the northern promised land that wasn't. And so she sets about in Detroit, right? And more than half of Rosa Parks' political life is a political life here in Detroit. And I think people sometimes forget that and don't mark the incredible courage that her continuing work in Detroit also, um, also entailed. So she, they still struggle for basically a decade to find work. Um, they, she continues to have health problems related to, um, to her bus stand. And then in 1964, she volunteers on the campaign of a young upstart lawyer who's trying um, to win the primary of a new Mo Michigan congressional district, right? This is the young John Conyers who's running for the first time for Congress. And she's volunteering in his campaign for jobs, peace, and freedom. Conyers and Parks are early, early opponents of US involvement in Vietnam. And she prevails on Martin Luther King to come to Detroit on Conyers' behalf, even though he's not doing any, you know, he's trying to stay away from political campaigns. And very much Conyers sees that as one of the things that turns the tide for him. He wins that primary, that first primary, by less than 100 votes. And um, so one of the first things he does when he is elected is he gives Rosa Parks a job working in his Detroit office. And there she continues kind of the struggle against northern, sort of northern racial inequality um, in housing, in jobs, in schools. And she continues that in the 60s, into the 70s, into the 80s. We have heard about her commitment to young people, right? That commitment to school desegregation, to school equality, to having black history in the curriculum. Um, a commitment to a criminal justice system that is fair and just to, to black people. So she, in the 60s and 70s, 
works on a number of political prisoner defense committees. She is part of the People's Tribunal after the 1967 Detroit uprising to investigate and expose police brutality and police repression during the 1967 riot. So her work continues on into the 60s, into the 70s, into forming her institute in the 1980s, right? So that courage, that lifetime of courage, that courage that begins with her grandparents and her mother, that begins in the NAACP, that begins on the bus, that begins in Detroit, that begins with her institute, right? That is a lifetime. And so what her, that courage and what honoring that courage I think requires of us today, right? Last month, right, on the anniversary of the bus boycott, President Obama tweeted a picture of himself as on the Rosa Parks bus here, right, in the Rosa Parks pose. She is, as one of my colleagues puts it, the American version of a national saint. But her legacy asks something of us, I believe. And if we are going to claim that legacy, then we must realize what it asks of us. Rosa Parks' courage was the ability to make an independent stand, even though she and others had done it before and nothing had changed, and even when she well understood the harm that might befall her, and to make those stands over and over and over throughout the course of her life. Even when the civil rights movement gained certain victories in the Civil and Voting Rights Act in the mid-60s, she continued on, joining with new and old comrades to press the struggle forward. Honoring her legacy then means summoning a similar courage. It requires acknowledging that America is not a post-racial society and the blight of racial and social injustice is deep and manifest. It entails a profound recommitment to the goals she spent a lifetime fighting for, a criminal justice system fair and just to people of color, unfettered voting rights, educational access and equity, real assistance to the poor, an end to US wars, and black history in all parts of the curriculum. Finally, it means heeding her words to Spelman students, don't give up and don't ever say the movement is dead. Thank you. OK. I have I have a question for each one of you. And you, you all did fabulously well. And if I were grading you, you would get A's. Okay. <laughs> so uh, for Doug, I wanted to ask you if part of the reason why we paid so much emphasis on Rosa Parks being this demure, gracious, kind, soft-spoken, Nonviolent, wouldn't raise her voice, wouldn't raise her uh, a flea, uh, or hurt her flea. It's because we have not probed the depth of her spirit and her politics. And so, how would you respond to uh, a suggestion that Rosa Parks comes from a prophetic tradition, a radical nationalist? tradition and an internationalist tradition. Maybe all of that is just too complex for us to understand, or should we make an effort to do so? Well, it's, um, it's my, yeah. Um, it's an excellent series, really, of questions there, and it's about the art of biography. Mrs. Parks, um, you know, at the end of her life, I mentioned was, got interested after going to Japan into Buddhism, and so, she was not somebody who coveted conflict. Uh, she was, you know, some people enjoy conflict. I've written a book on Theodore Roosevelt. He woke up every morning wanting to punch somebody. Uh, she didn't have that kind of anger, but except for the facing injustice. And as we just heard, the horrific Jim Crow system of, of beating and rape and the disenfranchisement and on and on and on. And she tried to do it with humility and grace, but when, it, when, when you're confronted with such evils, meaning after she mentioned James Blake went on the, she had an earlier incident with James Blake on a bus years before December 155, she simply wouldn't get on Blake's bus anymore. 
that wasn't going after Blake. It, she just did not want to ride it, in it. But when the day that came, you know, she had the she was going to confront him because it came. So I think that's part of it. Her personality is people that got to know her. She was so warm. She was so kind. It was hard to still see that steely revolutionary fiber in her because we tend to think of our revolutionary activist as having to be a finger in your face. And there are other styles of it, which is the way she kept papers for E.D. Nixon, the way she consci conscientiously you know, um, moved um, events forward, the way that she didn't let young people down, the way that she, as you just so nicely ended your talk about uh, never giving up. And there were other ways to the kind of the hope part of her. And so it was, it's kind of a balancing act. What I'm happy though on the 100th birthday, and I think all three of us share in you too, is that we're starting to get Rosa Parks into a focus because the pendulum went way too far in the other direction and I, it needs to be understood that this was somebody who was brave. She was, was at the March on Washington as a woman when they were excluding women on the March on Washington, meaning African American men didn't want women getting too big a role. So she stood up to all sorts of prejudice and, and bigotry in her life and, uh, and I think she is now a global figure. I've interviewed um, B Bishop Tutu once and he told me when he was in Africa, they the name Rosa Parks came to them before Martin Luther King. They were hearing about Rosa Parks sort of pick, picked up on what she did and it became, those two words meant something of great power. And I mentioned Mandela again, I mean, he's ill. And when, the, when Mandela dies, the world is going to go to him as a peacemaker, but he was also a great activist too. And you can be both, King, King could be both too, loving, but tough. Thank you. Um, Danielle, your, your book opens up a whole new way of talking about the civil rights movement. And I really applaud you for bringing to the fore the fact that Rosa was so involved in this, uh, in protesting and fighting and mobilizing against um, this violence against black women it was just horrific. And so what I wanted you to expound a little bit on is the fact that the Joanne Little case was so transformative as well. How do you connect uh, Rosa Parks with the Joanne Little in terms of making gendered violence and gendered resistance both important facets of the modern civil rights movement? Well, it's, again, such a great question. And I, I, I didn't know this part of Rosa Parks. And I discovered it in the archive and, and in little snippets and sentences and Doug's book and uh, Robin Kelly's book and other little places where you got the sense that maybe Rosa Parks was up to something kind of sinister in Alabama. And I, I mean that jokingly, that like she was investigating things that, you know, nobody wanted investigated. Um, and, and so I started seeing her name on petitions and postcards, and it was Jean, actually, who told me that when she was going through Rosa Parks' papers here at Wayne State that she found Rosa Parks' connection to the Free Joanne Little defense uh, here in Detroit, that she helped form and was part of the committee to work on Joanne Little's case. Now, I, some of you might not know the Joanne Little case, but Joanne Little was an African-American woman in uh, uh, Washington, North Carolina, an, an inmate. She was a petty criminal. Uh, and when she was in jail, the white jailer snuck into her cell with an ice pick and tried to rape her. Well, she got the ice pick away from him and stabbed him to death. And then she escaped. Uh, North Carolina put her on trial for murder, and there was a nationwide effort to free Joanne Little to defend her right to defend herself with violence if necessary. Rosa Parks was a part of that. So for me, you know, seeing that connection seeing her uh, respond to the Mr. Charlie, the way that she writes about in an essay, her involvement in the Reese Taylor case, and then the NAACP and Montgomery's involvement in all these rape cases in Montgomery leading up to the bus boycott, you start to see how important it was for black women to, that for them, freedom didn't just mean being able to sit at a lunch counter or riding in the front of the bus, it meant being able to move through the world without being assaulted.
without being touched inappropriately, without being called by their name, right? I mean, it meant being able to be free to have their own bodily integrity and respect. So the bus boycott is as much about black women gaining the right to bodily integrity on the buses as it is about segregation. And the freedom movement is as much about being able to move through the world uh, with liberty and without assault as it is about being able to access opportunity. Um, you can't be free if, you, if, if you're assaulted in that way. So um, I started to see how black women's vulnerabilities in the segregated system drove in many ways, that were catalysts for uh, larger campaigns for human justice and dignity. Very good, thank you. And thank you so much for your, your book and everybody has been talking about it. I mean, this is the, it's almost like uh, Rosa Parks uncensored, you know, unchained Rosa Parks. <laughs> Uh, and so what I would like to, to ask you to elaborate on, obviously Rosa Parks uh, is, is more associated with the traditional classic civil rights movement, and yet her politics and her activism continued into the black power era as well. And so one reading of Rosa Parks is that by the time you get to the black power movement and the whole uh, elect, uh, election of black uh, political figures to, to uh, you know, Congress and to the mayor's office, you're dealing with a radically different Rosa Parks. Uh, but you're suggesting, no, those two things exist simultaneously. Two political impulses exist simultaneously in one black woman's body. You want? Yeah, can I use your yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a couple of things, right? I mean, partly when we get to black power, a lot of the things that Parks has been working on, right? Let's, cr uh, criminal justice that's fair and just to black people. Black history. Independent black political power. Uh, um, uh, an international perspective self-defense, right? These are long-standing beliefs of Rosa Parks, and she has been working on these for years. And so when we get, to, when they emerge in the black power movement, right, these are not strange to her. I use a metaphor of quilting in my book. Uh, Rosa Parks was a quilter. And to me, black power, and how Mrs. Parks sees black power, right, is that it's part of a bigger quilt that, it's, that the patterns are not so different from other patterns and that it's sewn into the larger sort of tapestry of black struggle, right? So Mrs. Parks talks about Malcolm X as being her personal hero. And in part, I think that's because she sees him being like her grandfather. In part, that's because she, like Malcolm X, sees the black struggle as an international one. It's partly because she is in Detroit and sees kind of the sort of northern racism, and northern racism has a different cast to it, right? And it's politer, but it's still, it's still structured into you know, jobs and schools and housing. So in many ways, when we get to the black power movement, she keeps going because she, she's, those issues she's already been doing, Right? And because she's used to people saying those alliances are a problem, right? I mean, she gets red baited for decades, right? In the 50s and 60s, she gets called a communist, right? So she's used to people saying, don't make those alliances, don't work with those people, don't work on those issues, right? And so she continues on and she, she works in and alongside the black power movement and she continues on and she protests apartheid and she continues on and speaks at the Million Man March, right? She, mm -hmm. she is her own person, right? And she doesn't see these as opposites. She doesn't see you have to be either like King or Malcolm. You have to like Ella Baker or Queen Mother Moore, right? She brings all those people together and is inspired by them and I think is an inspiration to them. Absolutely, thank you. Sure. Uh, so, so nicely said. I just wanted to add that she personally loved Martin, just loved Martin Luther King, and Martin Luther King was really charming. 
and she was not, she was susceptible to his charm. He was so, they had a wonderful uh, history and she had a great friendship with Coretta for a long time too. But there's a, a funny story with, um, on that when Rosa Parks was asked by um, in an interview, um, foolishly, um, now when you, when you first met Martin Luther King, they went, she met him at a Pilgrim's Insurance Company in Montgomery and she went with um, jo, um, Johnny May Carr, and they went there, and it was only about five or six women hearing King talk. He was the new preacher in uh, Montgomery, and I uh, asked Mrs. Parks in Beverly Hills at one time with Elaine there, and said, did you, um, do, do, what, did you recognize King's greatness, your first time you're hearing him? And she said, um, no, I remember thinking, boy, is he cute. <laughs> <laughs> and I, the, the, the the point of being the cute thing is that she, Mrs. Parks, somebody who never took herself too seriously. She, there was never, she was not pompous. She, she would always come down to being earth, earthy, and it's why people were so attracted to her because she just, uh, you know, never. There was no, I'm an intellectual about her. She simply was. She was. She simply was. She was, and all the, that that entails. Are there questions from you, the audience? Anything that you're dying to, or living, uh, to ask? <laughs> yes. Before the August 1963 march in Washington, we had our own June 1963 march in Detroit. I was there, I took part. We walked down Woodward, and then we made a right turn on Jefferson to Old Cobo Hall. Only a fraction of those who took part in the march also went to Cobo to hear Dr. King speak. But that was the first time he gave his I Have a Dream speech uh, it was a warm-up for Washington. What was Mrs. Uh, and I did meet her in Congressman Conyers' office when he took office in '65, but she was uh, like you've described her, a humble, quiet person who worked very effectively, mostly behind the scenes. What was her role in the Detroit March for Freedom in, Ju in June of '63? So she's. Um She's at the front of the Detroit March for Freedom. She loves the speech that Martin Luther King gives there and plays it over and over. They record it. It's, Mo it's Motown's first sort of spoken word record. Uh, they put it out and she loves um, that speech. And if people haven't heard that speech that he gives at the Detroit Great March for Freedom, um, it's a huge march. It's al almost 200,000 pe 200, people. So it, the numbers in Detroit in many ways you know, uh, are comparable um, to what happens in August. And in many ways, we, King also previews that speech that he's going to give two months later. But she's there, um, and she's at the front. But curiously, um, and I think a couple of, we've talked about this a little bit today, I think the, the sexism of the time, she, nobody interviews her that day. She's sort of, she's there, but in some sense, one of the metaphors I use in my book is that Rosa Parks is hidden in plain sight, right? That many times she's there, but people don't ask her, you know, what she's thinking about that day, what she's doing. I don't know if other people want to. Someone else? Thank you. Thank you for your presentations today. They are just wonderful. And I'm Marilyn Zotis, and I'm the Director of Historical Resources here at the Henry Ford. We have an awesome responsibility to have Rosa Parks' bus in our collection, an awesome responsibility to share it with the public. Could you give us some challenges to how we take the story of Rosa Parks forward? How do we keep her story relevant to our society and the world today? Thank you. <laughs> 
you know, one of the things that I thought about today when I went on the bus for the first time, which was incredibly moving, was just the fact that so many people don't know the kind of power bus drivers had and what they did to black people who, you know, defied Jim Crow, who just wanted to get on the bus in the front and didn't want to go to the back, or who tried to get to the back but went a little too slow and they'd slam the door on them. You know, sometimes their feet would get caught. They, bus drivers dragged people to their deaths at times or just dragged them until they couldn't hardly, you know, uh, breathe another breath. So I think one of, the, one of the ways you could get students to grasp the courage that Parks had to do what she did on the bus was to have something about the dangers the bus posed to black people and exactly what might happen to them. Cooper Green, ha uh, the collection in Birmingham Public Library is a collection of bus drivers' reports of incidents on the buses, and there are tons of them. And so it would be a great thing to get that and just post on them so students could get a sense of the very real danger black people faced when they got on the bus. I think that would, that would help them see Parks' action in a really different light. Because I got on the bus today, in some ways as a mourner, because to me the bus is a site of violence. And it was like stepping onto a plantation. Because I knew all the horrors that had been inflicted, particularly on black women, um, on that bus especially. Yeah. I, I wonderfully said, I just want to tell you when, I remember when the Henry Ford um, acquired the bus, and you guys have done a fantastic job of restoring it and presenting it. And we wouldn't be here today with a postage stamp and a form like this. So thank you for what you've done with, um, saving, with saving the bus and making it into being this sort of national heirloom. I want of course, I want to say thank you to all of you for, for your contribution. And um, I wanted to ask um, Ms. Fia, Fia, help me out. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Theo Harris. Theo, Theo Harris. Um, I also see Malcolm X as a, as a hero. And um, I also see that they're a sense of alliance. And I'm just, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on that and um, maybe give um, uh, give, me, give us a sense of how to give me <laughs> a sense of how to how to articulate that that's that the, the quilting analogy that you gave was very good and um, I'm just inter interested in being able to to speak articulately about that you can see I can use a little help <laughs> thank you thank you um, I mean, I think, I mean, as Professor Hines sort of pointed out, I see Rosa Parks' story as a story of, of continuities and threads, right? And so those threads reappear. Uh, and so I think part of the way to think about Malcolm X and, and sort of what Malcolm X means to Rosa Parks and means to so many people, right, is both that, that embodied fearlessness, right? And there's this interesting moment Rosa Parks goes to Highlander Folk School five months before she makes her bus stand. And one of the people running the workshops is Septima Clark. She's a, a South Carolina teacher who's been fired for her job because she won't give up her membership in the NAACP. And Rosa Parks is, is in some sense, mentored by Septima Clark. And she's very in awe of Clark because Clark seems so calm and so determined and so unfazed and Rosa Parks feels so nervous and tight and just sort of worn down and, and just anxious all the time, right? And so I think one of the things I think in terms of, of remembering how people are activists is also that they look to other people for sustenance, right? And that part of what Malcolm X was was, was that fearlessness to kind of to sort of put things out there that needed to be said, right? And to embody them and to be, um, to be sort of a prophet figure, right? And I think in many ways, both I think Mrs. Park sees him in, in, in the sort of tradition of her grandfather, but I think she also draws sort of hope and sustenance from, from that courage, right? as I think many people do, and I think we forget that sort of this work is also people need 
people need to sort of be inspired by other people just as they are. So when I, um, they meet for the first time in 1963, and in part they meet because Malcolm X so wants to meet Rosa Parks, right? Because he is so impressed by her. Um, and then I'm going to say one more thing. I'm talking a lot, but there's a beautiful picture in my book that I hope everybody sort of just, which is Rosa Parks and Stokely Carmichael standing here in Detroit outside Central Congregational Church. Stokely Carmichael's come in 1966 to give a talk there. And Rosa Parks had just been in Lowndes County supporting this very courageous independent black political movement in Lowndes County. And so one of the first things Stokely Carmichael does from the pulpit that night is call out Mrs. Parks and call her my hero. And so I think we sometimes forget that people who are these longtime activists have to draw strength and sustenance from other longtime activists, right? So Rosa Parks draws sustenance from Malcolm, and Malcolm is inspired by her. And this is true of Stokely Carmichael mm -hmm. and many, many other people. But I should stop talking. I think we have one, one last question. Um, but before you ask your question, I just want to reiterate something about we draw hope and courage and inspiration from each other, from others who have, you know, acted in exemplary ways. And one of the reasons why I am so uh, enamored and love and treasure Rosa Parks is because I know that violence against women, gendered violence, and um, uh, slavery, human tra trafficking, are still with us today in this world. And we all need to stand up and say, enough of this. This is crazy. You know, oh, we are denying people ownership of themselves. And Rosa Parks didn't cut into that kind of behavior. And so, I feel inspired that I can speak my mind now about, you know, gendered violence and anti-slavery and globalization that's really destroying people's economic welfare, their environment, whatever. I can say anything I want to say to advance the cause of human justice because Rosa Parks did it first. Thank well, you. And I, yeah. <laughs> We, one more question, and then they're going to throw us off the. Uh... Okay, okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much uh, for being panelists today, as well as Henry Ford Museum for putting on this 100th uh, birthday anniversary for Rosa Parks, Mrs. Rosa Parks. Uh, I would just like to ask a question of Henry Ford Museum. And I had an experience on Saturday that is still moving me, uh, which was at the DIA Film Theater. And that was a young lady uh, who has produced a Rosa Parks story. Julie Dash is her name. The story was so poignant and moving that I'm hoping that we can somehow expand that viewing to broader audiences. And I am a professional civil rights enforcer with the state of Michigan. I have also lived in South Africa during the time of President Nelson Mandela. And what is really driven home to me right now as a citizen of the United States is that we still talk separation. And I'm saying that for the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn and the DIA, which represents the culture, cultural center of Detroit, to come together, create a collaboration and a fusion, perhaps at the next anniversary, if you do this next year, and the Museum of African American History. But to begin to come together and not just have separate venues to represent something that is a movement that we are endorsing here today. So my question to you panelists and great authors is can you endorse something like that as you continue to go out and speak throughout the United States? Because we're talking right now in a new era. We are the cornerstone of a new era. And we are the ones who will be producing 
what our young people will be inheriting as a legacy. So in keeping with Rosa Parks and her courage, we need to endorse that courage even at the level of our Head Start children because they are coming into the beginning of consciousness. So we can raise up a new nation as she has given her life for, as well as the others in terms of Martin Luther King, et cetera. So if you would take that into your hearts and consider how that can be done and produced, even at the presidential level, through the United States Department of Education, we need to begin to fuse in America, and that's unity and diversity. Thank you. Absolutely. You said it so brilliantly. Eloquent. Thank you. Of course, I don't own any part of the Ford Museum, but I do believe in institutional cooperation, collaboration, pooling resources, mutual support of programs. And if, you can, if we can get to that level where there's something going on at one institution that another institution would like to co-sponsor or be partners of, or just have your name there representing, that that would be a really good thing. There is so much black history out here. We need scholars of all stripes, if you will, and political persuasion and ethnicities working on these fundamental questions of how do we expand this democracy, how do we make freedom real, and we need the institutional support of places like the Art Museum and, and the History Museum and the Ford Museum. And, you know, and after you get it tight here, then reach out to Chicago so that we can start some collaborations along, uh, along those lines. Uh, there's nothing to stop us except ourselves. So, Fort. Thank you. Yeah, you know, you, she did perfect for all, she speaks for all of us. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>